Nydia, I am so glad that you are here today with me, and Nydia Prakash, and I got to meet you just a couple of weeks ago at the Samuel Smith House, which I don't remember. Were you in costume? Were you dressed for the occasion? No. No, I was in, I was in very modern dress. <laughs> okay, okay. There were some people who were dressed up for that yes. occasion. So that was just a perfect spot to meet you because that's one of your passions is Pretty what much. I understand. Exactly. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to be here. Oh, good. I'm glad you're here. Nice to be able to sit down and have a conversation. So tell me, Nydia, you, are, you just graduated 2020 yes. from George Washington University. Yes. which is in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Yep. Okay, what a great place oh, to yeah. study international affairs and history, just right there in the seat of government. Yeah, exactly. It was great. There were a lot of great opportunities for connections and internships and that sort of thing. So I had a lot of really good experiences down there. What was your internship? Oh, I did lots. I did, let's see, um, I did one at a fundraising firm, um, Berger Hirschberg, and what else did I do? I did one at the um, JICC, which is the Japan Information and Culture Center. Oh, so nice. It's kind of like the cultural branch of the embassy, basically. It's attached to the embassy, but it's its own organization. Mm -hmm. um, and it does cultural outreach and you know programs for kids to learn about Japanese culture, basically, that sort of thing. Um, and Too bad they didn't send you to the Olympics, huh? I know. I wish. <laughs> so it's funny because we were doing, this was in 2020, mm -hmm. and we were doing um, trying to put together like an exhibition comparing the 1970s Tokyo Olympics and then the modern mm -hmm. 2020 Tokyo Olympics and then that didn't end up happening. Aww. So it was all right. It was a fun, it was a really good experience though. I got to work with a lot of really cool people That's who had great. lived there and all oh. that. Yeah, and then um, the other one that I did was um, ICRD, which is the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. Mm. Um, and it is what the name sounds like. Mm -hmm. It is not a religious organization, but it aims to kind of combine um, religious techniques and outreach with diplomacy to solve issues in which religion is, you know, a big factor mm. um, and is not necessarily addressed by people in international affairs. So it was mm. also a really fascinating experience. Well, you <laughs> have learned so much, and then now you're off to graduate school yes. up in Boston area. Yes. Because Tufts actually isn't in Boston, it's outside. It's right outside. It's in Medford. So Medford, I'm that's very right. Very close to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, oh, nice. Yeah, it's awesome. It's oh. a great place to be. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. So, and then and you're studying history up there yes. as well. And yes. you said that you're kind of a. Um, your fort perhaps is ancient global yes. history. What does that mean? So, it's kind of a. It's not really a made up category. I don't know if ancient global history is the word for it. It's the word I use, which is why, you know, it's a little iffy, but um, ancient global history basically is about, it's combining ancient history with global history. Global history in the modern sense mm. is um, about connections and patterns that repeat between countries, the interactions of countries, um, and, you know, the different ways that, you know, diasporas and trade and all that stuff. So just more globally focused mm -hmm. and how people interact. Um, and then ancient history is ancient history, so it's taking the global approach and applying it to ancient studies instead of just one ancient civilization. It's the connections between them um, and the transformations that happen, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So when we talk about ancient, what would the dates of that so be? So for me personally, um, I right now am more focused on the ancient Middle East. So um, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Um, Greco-Roman Egypt is, you know, a really interesting place to be if you're a historian mm -hmm. um, and my future thesis hopefully is going to focus on um, late antique mm -hmm. um, Egypt which is we'll say like 200s AD mm -hmm. to maybe 500s AD somewhere mm -hmm. around there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so do you get to go to these places I haven't have... yet okay I'd like to one day um, yeah it would be really nice I would just think the archaeological oh my gosh. dig and opportunities of actually seeing the sites and being on. Oh, it would be a dream. It would be an absolute dream. Mm. I haven't I haven't had the opportunity yet, but um, hopefully soon, one day. And I imagine that you're fluent in more than just English. What languages do you speak? So I speak um, Japanese fluently. Oh, you yes, do? Yes, which is like a very strange combination, I'm well aware, because um, obviously nobody in ancient Greece spoke Japanese. but. but I speak it, so mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I picked it up. I took classes in college, um, and I had kind of been not really studying, but just kind of picking up what I could um, in the later years of high school, too. So 
I studied abroad there. I think I can speak it pretty well. Nice, yeah. nice. Well, and pretty soon, hopefully, you'll get to go to Japan. Oh, it would and be so nice. Yes, yeah. yes. Are there people in the area that speak Japanese, or is there a in Connecticut a nice little community that you can? Not, not as much. No. no. Um, so I have a couple. A lot of my friends are international students mm -hmm. because I was in DC. Sure. Um, so I do have a couple like Japanese friends who helped me practice basically, um, had conversations with me, and I still keep in touch with them. Nice. So there's that, but there's not really that much in Connecticut specifically that I'm aware of. Mm. It's funny though because there's a lot of Japanese um, grocery stores, restaurants, that kind of thing in Medford where I am right mm. now. So mm. there is that connection, yeah. I wouldn't it's expect fun. that, but no. me no. neither, but yeah, yeah it, they're there. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. Now, we had a Japanese exchange student living with really? us for a while. It awesome. was, uh, you know, what, like, I can't remember the name of the program, but he came and lived with us for six months, wow. so we had the opportunity, and his name was Taku. Cool, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was really an interesting experience, you know, cultural differences Definitely. and getting him to... Uh, different sporting events or just going to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. He was just like, it's so big. I, yeah. I, <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember Japan was very, it was a wonderful place, but just space-wise, it mm -hmm. was such an adjustment because mm -hmm. everything's very narrow. Mm -hmm. They and only have tall, some, right? And tall, yeah. yes. Everything's up. And mm -hmm. um, I just wasn't used to that, so I was kind of like bumping into stuff. I was mm -hmm. like, ah, mm -hmm. I have so little room. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it was a great place to be. I loved it there. Mm -hmm. I nice. So, uh, will you get to have some more experiences along that line of... Um, I would hope so. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. I, I would like to, you know, go back. Um, I was considering for a bit in, in 2020 after graduating, um, going to teach English in, in Japan mm -hmm. um, through something like the JET program, which the Japanese embassy runs. Um, but then 2020 happened and mm -hmm. that kind of mm -hmm. shut off that line. Derailed so. us yeah. in a lot of our plans and our dreams. So, why do you think history is important? Some people just don't think we need to study the past. What yes, you, and this is, you know, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I'll tell try, me, please. I'll try to keep them short. But, no, no, um, we have 20 minutes. So, okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, so I think a lot of the reason that people don't particularly think that studying history is as important maybe um, as other things like STEM classes, for example, is that history has been taught wrong. Mm. Um, and I don't necessarily mean that the facts we've learned are wrong, although in many cases there's a debate, you know, there's a big debate about that sure. in the current um, period, but the way in which history is taught methodologically. So, so how should we teach it? Well, it's been a lot about memorizing dates, right. memorizing facts and right. people and, you know, events and that sort of thing. But the important thing and what I try to focus on with the ancient global history, which is more about what are the underlying patterns, what are the forces at work, mm -hmm. you know, how are people's lives made and shaped, I mean, you can't have anything in the present without everything that came before it. Correct. So, you know, focusing more on these broader patterns, these broader ideas, and, you know, the deeper kind of whatever's going on at work and the, the powers that be, essentially, is what history at the core, to me, really is. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than making it about memorizing a bunch of dates and facts, you know, really teaching the flow of time basically and what we can pull out of people's experiences that match our own because human nature is constant it's completely unchanging and that's something that you really encounter when you work with ancient history mm -hmm. is that humans don't change we're essentially the same creatures no matter how much technological advances we made so i mean i think teaching it in that way where it's more relatable and it's more about what it means to be a person and what forces are at work in the world that humans live in mm -hmm. is so important for creating educated minds, you know, open and accepting minds, um, and critical analysis, mm -hmm. just generally being able to look at evidence, put together an argument, no matter what it is, um, and, and stand by it in the face of other arguments, because there's going to be, everyone's going to have a different perspective, mm -hmm. is something that you can't get out of math and science, mm -hmm. because, you know, the answer in math is the answer, and the answer in science is the answer. Mm. But there's so much complexity in the world we live in. You can only learn that if you learn those critical analysis skills through history. Oh, I love that. Yeah, you know. Oh, beautiful So I think answer. it's very important. So you talk about patterns. So what patterns should we look at? I'm thinking, yeah, go ahead, definitely. talk about some of the patterns. Well, so, for example, I tend to end up focusing a lot on um, religious history, mm -hmm. on economic history also. Economics, I think which is, is awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just... Oh, excuse me. No, no problem.
Okay, I'm sorry. No, no. Um, so economics. Yes, economics, definitely. So um, ancient economics is a field that is, you know, just barely born, essentially. Um, it started kind of in the 70s, essentially, and it's really only starting to pick up steam now. But for example, in ancient economics, if you look, I read a really, really great book um, in class this past semester where if you take a comparative approach to all these different societies, mm -hmm. you know, say the Aztecs, um, to, you know, the, the Chinese, ancient Chinese, and, um, you know, even in the in Mesopotamians and all those, the Babylonians, you can identify through their economics and the way that they supported themselves common ways that humans, you know, got together in these ancient times where we didn't have electricity and we didn't have all these things to help each other out, mm -hmm, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, for example, so um, community would community be another is a, pattern. is a huge pattern. Okay. Um, you know, the ways that in which we choose to produce and then to tax, there are fundamental similarities in, you know, the ways that people paid for things, the ways that value was calculated. Mm -hmm. It's always calculated socially. Mm -hmm. um, and we're finding, for example, in ancient economics that what a lot of scholars in the past have misunderstood as them just not getting money and mm. not getting, you know, finances and that sort of thing is not necessarily the case because in some cases when you're trading in kind and you're making a trade that to us in the modern day just seems completely like imbalanced like why would they give you that it's so worth so much more mm. than whatever you're getting what you're getting in the balance is status so there's another element that we hadn't seen before in the mm. past that we can see now so you know there's always a power dynamic to the things that we're giving and taking. And mm -hmm. you can see that more clearly when there's not paper money mm -hmm. being passed around because that oversimplifies it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are all these patterns to the ways that we coalesce into communities, mm -hmm. how those communities, you know, work and then stratify themselves into different, you know, social statuses and, and hierarchies. And you can see that everywhere, you know, no matter what continent you're on, mm -hmm. the pattern remains the same. Even if the form is different, the pattern overall underlying it is the same. That's really fascinating. It is. It's really fascinating. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So do you do like flow charts of these different things? Like That's definitely one way um, to help. So that book that I was talking about had a lot of graphics and a lot of flow What was charts. the name of that book? Um, oh, it was called... Um, Ancient Economics, A Global Comparative Approach, something like that. It was uh -huh. a very recent book, too. It was uh -huh. only published in 2020. Oh, wow. So, you know, this is really like, I don't want to say cutting edge, but it is kind of cutting it edge. It is stuff. kind of cutting edge. Yeah, and it was a really fantastic thing to study. So, you know, just being able to find those similarities between just the randomest, the most separated, you know, ancient societies is fantastic and mm -hmm. I think it reveals a lot about where we came from and how we go about doing things you mm -hmm. know mentally mm -hmm. it's really cool what about culture I mean, the culture of different money exchanges yes. is really different oh too. absolutely yeah what do you see with that well so it's really interesting there because a lot of times religion is so deeply involved mm. with all of these concepts um, and you know since we're in the, the modern secular world it's difficult for people to understand that in the ancient world Things like culture, mm -hmm. religion, economy, they weren't separated mm -hmm. out into their own categories. Mm -hmm. So you, you're not doing something with a religious motive. It's just that that's what it is. You know, mm -hmm. religion is there and you have to incorporate it into everything you're doing. You're just not thinking about it consciously as this is my religious belief. It's what is. Mm -hmm. It's what's true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, religion is, is a huge motivating factor in culture and in economics, for example, in the ancient Middle East all these precious stones mm. were very expensive. They were a huge part of, you know, luxury trade, and mm -hmm. it's because they were used in rituals. So, mm. you know, lapis lazuli, um, different crystals mm. were all hugely significant, even though we consider them today to be semi-precious stones. They're not even, you know, mm -hmm. gems, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And so the way that, you know, the needs of how people are meeting their needs, basically, mm -hmm. with economics, and you know what they have available and what they believe is how you kind of get culture coming out of this and of course it comes out differently based on what you have and where you are so china has different stuff you know incenses and and um you know resins sap mm -hmm, paper mm -hmm. silk they have all of that and so that's kind of what their culture coalesces around and in the ancient middle east you get you know stones you get glass um and you know pottery mm -hmm, that kind of mm -hmm. thing yeah so the products that come out are different but the process underneath it is the same. It's mm. how are people assigning value to things based on what, where they are. And what they need, And what perhaps. they need, yes, right. exactly. Yeah, and location I think is so interesting oh, too because 
you know, if you live along the interstate, and you know, why is the yes. interstate, or why are certain roads in certain places? Exactly. Yes. You know, and it, we find that um, merchant towns, that sort of thing, places of great commerce, they're really rich cities, are often you know on water, mm -hmm. for example. So because it's easier to transport, it's less dangerous, and it takes it's quicker to mm -hmm. transport things by river or by you know ocean um, sailing and that sort of thing than it is over land, which is can be very unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll find that all these like major cities are on rivers, mm -hmm. essentially, or or on, on the coast. Mm -hmm. um, and so geography is hugely important in that sense. Mm. It's so interesting. It and how does environment play into all of this? Is it, tell me. It's a, it's a huge part. <laughs> I just, you know, um, environment is hugely important. So for example, um, in the ancient Mediterranean, so Greece and Rome, you have this kind of like very homogenous geography mm -hmm. where it's, you know, it's arid, it's good for raising olives, mm -hmm. um, not so great for livestock, so it's mm -hmm. mostly agrarian. Mm -hmm. um, and the geo the environment and, and how things warm and cool, you know, mm -hmm. with little ice ages and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, mm -hmm. can cause serious problems for um, civilizations mm -hmm. when, you know, when they're not stewarded necessarily. But even in ancient Rome, mm -hmm. you have a sense of environmental preservation, which mm. is crazy to think about mm -hmm. because, you know, it seems like they were just using resources willy-nilly and, you know, throwing lions into coliseums and that sort of thing. Mm. But there is a sense of environmental preservation um, for religious and practical reasons. Mm -hmm. So environment is a hugely important consideration also, yeah. Mm. When I visited Rome, I was so amazed, of course, the saying, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. And you, have you been to Rome or no, I not yet? yet. Okay, no. I can't wait I for you go. to go to some of <laughs> these places and travel because you'll just be so much smarter. Oh, I'm sure. Smarter I'll than you already are, oh, which will be amazing. But when I was there, I was just really taken aback by the diversity within the city mm -hmm. and how they um, ab ab um, sustain their older buildings mm -hmm. and preserve them. You know, sometimes I think you'll just see a, a building implode and taken down, and yep. there like little arches will be left up and it's yeah. kind of in the middle of no place and you oh, yeah. like wonder why is that but I it's love been there, yeah. yeah 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 I just love that respect oh and definitely I think it's something that you know is very important because if you can't you know people say out of sight out of mind all the time mm. and it's really true you know if you don't if you're not seeing these things it's very easy to just kind of get stuck in the modern day in the present and be mm. like oh we're just mm. here we're not just here, right? You know, no. we've gotten here, basically. Right, right. Well, life is short, you know, yeah, and our absolutely. life span is not that long. No, so, it's not. Uh, history is, you know, like what you're saying, just so vital for the understanding of the process of mm -hmm. different things. And what about, you know, some people are talking more about collegiality and kindness, and that we're a little short on that right oh, now in our yes. environment, in our current culture of what's going on. Oh yeah, it's it's a tough question because. Like I said, history is a lot of gray, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's gray today. It was gray then. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, stuff that obviously we would consider appropriate, good, moral mm -hmm. that went on and was just kind of the norm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, slavery is a big example of that. Even in ancient, you know, societies, obviously, mm -hmm. slavery was hugely important to the economy. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because you can see differences throughout time, even mm -hmm. in a practice like slavery. So, mm -hmm. for example, in ancient Rome, there was no racial bias to slavery. Mm -hmm. It was a status. It mm -hmm. was just, if you're a prisoner of war, sucks for you. Mm -hmm. um, but you could even work your way up in status and buy yourself out of slavery. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, if you go to you know, early modern America, that's very much not the case mm -hmm. because you ha now have a racial component mm -hmm. and it's a lifelong thing. Mm -hmm. So you know, there are things that you can trace the development of and you can see you know, if we have a situation in our country today, well, why might that be the case here when it wasn't the case in Rome? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. So you can gain perspective, I think, mm -hmm. on a lot of these issues, on why they happened. And it's important to recognize that people in the past are people in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't, we can't emulate everything they were doing. We shouldn't emulate everything no. they were doing. But we also have to understand that that was their time and you know that's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And what we can learn from that is we can learn that people are complex. Mm -hmm. People are people have good sides and bad sides. You know, they can do awful things that doesn't necessarily make them terrible people, mm -hmm. evil people. But we can learn about how we've progressed and how to be better mm -hmm. as humans, essentially, as a society, mm -hmm. um, while at the same time giving people 
the benefit of the doubt as much as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding that there are complex motivations and forces that go into every decision, you mm. know, no matter who you are or where you're from. Mm. Everybody has, you know, something going on. So Oh absolutely. Yeah. 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 So true. Yeah. Wow. You're so wise. Uh, for <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm really fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of really smart people who mm. have taught me a lot of really good things. Mm. Um, so you mm. know Do, I'm really lucky. Stuff. Um, when after you get your thesis done, and yeah. you'll have your PhD, well, my master's, master's, yes, and hope maybe PhD after that. We'll mm -hmm. see. Um, mm -hmm. My goal is to teach. I'd like to teach. Is that it? Yes. I, I was going to ask you what your end goal would be. Yes, yes. I would love to be teaching. Um, maybe high school, maybe college. We'll see where the road takes me, I guess, but definitely education. Lovely. Yeah. And that would be so great because then you would activate a whole another generation definitely. of different kind of learning. and Yes, and, for uh, sure. Yeah. I think there's definitely, I mean, a lot of my classmates in, co in my cohort are um, also looking to be educators. Um, and I think it's it's definitely, there's, a, there's kind of a changing sense of what history is and how it should be taught. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, I can see in my classmates and my friends as well. So I, I would love to be a part of kind of like a new wave of education. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really hope we can kind of show people how history is important and interesting a little more than has been done in the past, maybe. We'll see. Well, and I think geography is so important, Definitely. too. Definitely, yeah. When my son was in high school, he started a geography club at East Lime High. Oh, awesome. And I don't know if, if you went to East Lime High. No, I went to NFA, actually. Oh, okay, yes. okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was just a great way for the kids to identify different places in the world Definitely. and learn about those places. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. So did you have some history teachers that inspired you? How oh, did you definitely. get involved with this at this point? Well, it's an interesting question because I've always loved history. Mm -hmm. um, and I never really considered that I could make a career out of it, basically. It's why I was going for international affairs mm. um, in the first place. And then as I was going, I was realizing all the classes I was taking for my international affairs major were history classes. Oh. And, you know, just kind of noticing that and realizing well, how much I love this and, you know, meeting a lot of great professors at GW um, and even thinking back to my experiences at NFA where, you know, my history teachers there like um, Mr. Kelly Gillette, who I believe is retired now, no. um, you know, I was just kind of like, wow, this is something that everybody's learning and nobody's really absorbing. Mm. It's so big a part of the curriculum and people are kind of just taking it and getting through it and then moving on with their lives. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And it's so fascinating. I was like, this is so interesting. Why, mm -hmm, are, mm -hmm. why aren't more people into this? Mm -hmm. um, Do you think it's yeah. the textbooks and how they're written? Or? I think that's probably a big part of it. Um, and again, the teaching style with, with the, the this happened and then this happened mm. and memorize these facts and these mm. dates mm. is a big part of why it's not really catching on. Mm. Um, so like I said, you know, transforming that style of, of education, not even just in history, but you know, wherever it's applicable mm -hmm. um, in English, even in math or in science, you know, if it's applicable, if it's applicable, you know, I think that's just a great way to get people more interested in learning mm. and yeah. So kind of having agency, I, I think is what yeah. they call it, over yes. your own outcome and I, identifying what it is that you want or are interested yes. in. It's almost like independent studies within the different exactly. domains, right? Exactly, of, yes. So. I think that's something that's so necessary because I remember, I'm still very close to my high school and college years, nice. um, so I remember them vividly and I remember, you know, wanting to, to learn more about this or my classmates wanted to learn about that, you know, mm. something like that. Every student wants to specialize in something and obviously there's a limit to how far we can go with that mm -hmm. in public schools. Mm -hmm. um, but having that agency and being able to, you know, narrow down what you're really interested in mm. um, while also learning, you know, base skills like mm -hmm. the critical analysis skills mm -hmm. or like the logic skills you get from STEM, STEM classes, mm -hmm. you know, is it would be so valuable, mm. I think, in education. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. So I, I see a new wave coming, and I'm really glad I hope that. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can bring this out. So when we get into it, as far as like studying it, um, you see more like authentic kinds of research where you're doing yeah. first person analysis. I of, would love that. Yes, I definitely think so. Just because, you know, there's a lot there's just a lot to every subject mm -hmm. and so allowing each student you know as much as possible to find what interests them um, in terms of all these different forces that we have whether it's religion whether it's sociology psychology um, 
you know, eco economics, all these different things, having them be able to pick what they're interested in and then really get down into the nitty gritty of it as much as possible. Well, I think it starts early too. One of my yeah. best friends, she was actually my son's preschool teacher mm -hmm. and she just didn't have the kids build with blocks, but she would put up a picture of the Taj Mahal yeah. and have them replicate that. And this is preschool. Yeah. So he would make these little things and say, Mom, this is the, awesome. <laughs> the Taj Mahal. <laughs> or this is the Coliseum or something That's like that. Great. And, yeah. you know, it, it's never too. Um, I don't know. You, I, so you no, can it's start, never too early. It's yeah. never too early, but then also it's never too late either. Exactly. So Absolutely. Continuing to learn and to be curious. And do you think you can teach curiosity? How do you? That's a really good question. I think you can, as a teacher, be enthusiastic. And I think it's important to connect with the student where they're at mm -hmm. rather than, you know, make the student come up to your level. Mm. So if you, you know, it's all about just getting to know your students. I've, I've recently TA'd my first class and oh, it was nice. such a fantastic experience. Um, and I had a great group of students. So really getting to know them and being, you know, just upfront with them about what's going on, what we're, why we're learning this, you know, mm. how this is relevant is so important. And yeah, I think once you connect with someone, mm -hmm. even if you can't teach curiosity, maybe you can spark their own enthusiasm for something else. Well, I think enthusiasm is contagious. So yes, I think definitely. that if you're excited, that, that that just kind of spills over and they'll get excited That's because goal, you're yep. so engaging and excited about whatever the topic is. Yeah. Oh, well, that's great. Well, we just have a couple of minutes left. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you would like to share the, um, to huh. take back to your university professors to let them know about the great work that you're doing, oh, showing well, up mean, for Samuel Smith and all the historic sites around the area? I mean, it's I've had a lot of really great opportunities, and I'm just really grateful, mm. um, especially for the Tufts program, which was has been awesome. It's been, you know, really intimate, very small, with a lot of great professors and great opportunities. Um, and, you know, I've gained a lot of skills from it. And I think that's what's kind of given me the opportunity to be at places like Samuel Smith. And I'm just having so much fun. Good. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful and I'm looking forward to the future. Oh, good. I'm so happy for you. So thank, thank you, you so much for being my guest. Thank you for having me. <coughs> I just got